Sega action into your home. Sega Channel. This isn't cable TV you watch, it's cable TV you play. When you stop watching TV and start playing it on Sega Channel, you'll get up to 50 different games a month. Setting up to play is easy with Sega Channel. Here's how it works. Take the Sega Channel adapter. $15 a month, so basically it costs less than 30 cents a game. The variety is incredible and it's a great deal for the money. The first episode of this series was about the Super Famicom Satellaview, which was a satellite modem add-on that allowed games to be downloaded to the Super Famicom in 1995. That was a technical wonder in itself for such a year, and was way ahead of the bell curve. But did you know that Sega released its own version using cable TV for the Genesis? You probably do if you grew up in the 90s since it did originate on the right hand side of the North Pacific, but for those not in the know, the Sega Channel was a subscription service that essentially allowed 50 games a month to be streamed to your Sega Genesis for the low low price of $14.95 monthly. This also included demos of which hadn't yet been released, exclusive games, as well as additional content like cheat codes and competitions. Streamed really isn't the right word technically, but in essence it worked like how the PlayStation Now service does in the modern day, except of course in 1994. It's because of this that the Sega Channel is a wonder of the retro gaming world. Much like the Satellaview, Sega Channel very much resembles an internet streaming service in the present, but obviously without using the internet considering the error. While the Satellaview relied on satellites to transmit data, the Sega Channel instead utilised cable television. Having said that though, for a lot of users the satellite was actually present in the process, albeit indirectly. The content would change monthly, and this was uploaded from a satellite station in Denver, Colorado to a satellite called the Galaxy 7. This was then downloaded by the cable providers, who would then release it to their subscribers' loop. This wasn't how it was done in all regions though, with some cable providers bypassing the satellite altogether and adopting the snail mail method. They would actually receive a physical CD-ROM in the mail from Sega every month, and then release the data to the sticky and smelly masses from there, which really shows the antiquity of it all. A quite a roundabout method for sure, but it was pre-broadband, so whatever worked I guess. Two signals were then broadcast over the cable simultaneously. One was continuous which was used for the menus, while another looped every 30 seconds. This was used to download the games, which meant there sometimes could be a delay as you waited for the loop to get to your desired game download. After a testing phase in 1993, the Sega Channel was formally launched in the December of 1994, five years after the launch of the Genesis. There was a $25 installation fee as well as the monthly payment, which traded for the adapter from TCI or Time Warner Cable. The adapter itself was quite simple in its use, as it plugged into the cartridge slot and enabled the service to run when the console was switched on. This adapter also required its own power brick, as well as a necessary coax cable to connect it into cable television. The adapter had its own 4 megabyte RAM RAM chip, which is what the data downloaded to. Because of RAM's nature though, in which it can basically only hold data while there is an electric current, meant that as soon as the Genesis was switched off, all the game data downloaded in that session would then be lost. There was plenty to play and try when you switched it back on however, as the Sega Channel's main selling point was the access of up to 50 games per month. This changed most months too, with the game being split into different categories. As well as the usual suspects you'd expect to play from Sega like the Road Rash, Golden Axe or Sonic series, there were also a few other special categories. Test drives were more or less demos for up and coming or brand new games. They allowed the player to try the full games, but with a catch. There was a time limit which varied depending on the game, and even though the player could play these test drives as many times as they pleased, the time limit would always reset and fast reset the game. These time restrictions varied from game to game too, depending on the genre. Long and involved games like RPGs would be given longer limits, while more action or arcade oriented titles would be given less. There's also a short-lived part of the service called Express Games. This allowed users to actively rent new games for 48 hours for an extra fee of $2.95 per game. It was only ever offered through a small number of cable operators however, and ultimately Express Games was discontinued in 1996 after only being active for one year. Beyond those there are also exclusive games available, as well as those which didn't have a physical release in certain regions. These included the likes of Mega Man The Willy Wars, which was previously only available in power regions in Japan, and an unreleased version of Earthworm Jim. Being constantly connected to Sega while playing the games had its perks too. As well as on-screen help on how to play each game along with hints, there are also cheats available if you're into that sort of thing. Additionally, there are even competitions held. One such example was for Primal Rage, where gamers were given the chance to finish it off in 24 hours. Hours. If they achieved that, then a phone number was displayed, which could be called to make the user eligible for prizes. On the other end of the spectrum though, if worried parents didn't want little Jimmy knocking punks off motorbikes and road rash, then a parental
parental control system was available. I'm sure this was seen as a negative for many of the players, but anything to keep Sega in the good books, as I'm sure the parents would have actually been paying for it. Hey parents, listen up! Be responsible, cause it's that simple. Being such a service 15 years ahead of its time meant there were of course a few kinks. As previously mentioned, as the game data was downloaded to RAM, it meant that all data was lost when the Genesis was turned off. While it seems it only took a few minutes to download each game, the failure rate of the download was a common problem. Distortion or noise on the cable networks were usually to blame for this, and generally the only fix was to reset the console and try again. Since the second signal also took about 30 seconds to loop through all the content, there might have been additional wait before what you wanted was broadcast. On top of that too, some games had reduced content from their physical releases because of the amount of RAM available for storage. One such casualty was Super Street Fighter 2. While the technical problems were largely unavoidable and probably only short inconveniences for most players, the Sega channel could not be saved from Sega itself. Having launched so late in the Genesis career probably would have raised some eyebrows, but this might have been down to the technology available and the time it took to organise contracts with the cable providers. Even with its late shortcomings though, the Sega channel impressively managed 250,000 subscribers at its peak in the US of A, so it was by no means a failure. Even with it launching so late, it managed along for four years, being officially discontinued on the 31st of July in 1998. The reasons for ending are pretty straightforward. For one, the Sega Saturn had already been around for three years by that time. Sega likely wanted to focus on that, but other possible reasons might include the fact that the SNES was dominating the 16-bit scene by that point, as well as emerging 32-bit consoles like the Sony PlayStation or the Nintendo 64. One could argue that Sega were going through hard times with failed Genesis add-ons like the Sega CD or the 32X, and that the Sega channel was a victim of those failures. But really, four years starting from 1994 in the Genesis lifetime is quite an achievement in itself and should not be ignored. And with saying that, the Sega channel left quite a legacy. It pioneered games on demand streaming services which lead into modern day equivalents like PlayStation Now. Sega also helped more than the gaming world too, as it was instrumental in cleaning up the cable networks of the time. As mentioned, noise could interrupt the downloads, so it was quite important that the broadcasts were clean. Sega did a lot to ensure the signal was cleaned up as much as possible, which would have benefited general cable users as well as gamers. On the other hand however, it also paints a bleak picture for digital only content and its preservation. Unlike some of the Satellaviews content which saved to cartridges, ensuring future generations could enjoy it natively, everything on the Sega channel was lost once the console was switched off. This may not matter for games you can get physical releases of anyway, but all the special exclusives are now lost forever. It makes you wonder what will happen in the future, as more and more games go digital only. What challenges will the retro gamer of 2055 have? I guess, only time will tell. Hello retro gamers, and thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, then may I please recommend others in the Wonders of the Retro Gaming World series. In other episodes, I've covered the Super Famicom Satellaview and the Net Eurose. If you have any ideas for future episodes as well, then please let me know. I won't be able to cover them immediately, but all suggestions will be considered. Again though, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.